My name is uh, Dr Mike Church, I'm an environmental archaeologist here in Durham University and I work in the um, North Atlantic region looking at um, the interaction between humans and their environment in places such as the Western Isles of Scotland, uh, Orkney and Shetland and also Faroes, Iceland and Greenland. I've been doing this for over 20 years and it's great fun. Well, as an environmental archaeologist in the North Atlantic, uh, the first thing we try and do is we try to reconstruct the um, past environments. And the North Atlantic is a great place for doing this because we have the kind of temperate northwest European areas of Atlantic Scotland all the way through to the high Arctic in Greenland. And we're not just interested in just looking at one snapshot at a time. We try to look at um, the way that the environment changed over time, especially over the past 10,000 years in the present interglacial. Um, but importantly, we're archaeologists, so humans are the centre of our research, and so we're also looking at societies, how they actually colonised these areas, how they arrived in these areas, how they learnt to live in these different environments, and importantly, how they adapted to past climate change. Past climate change obviously has importance when thinking about past societies as well, because we can look at the adaptation to rapid environmental change which is obviously one of the um, major challenges for 21st century science. There's a kind of a series of waves of colonisation that occur at different time periods. So in Atlantic Scotland, very recently, part of the research that I'm undertaking, we've started to find evidence that the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers are arriving in the Outer Hebrides, the Western Isles of Scotland, and Orkney and Shetland, um, in the kind of traditional time frames of the um, main parts of Scotland as well. This is very new research because it's been unknown for hundreds of years any Mesolithic sites, hunter-gatherer sites in these areas. These people have arrived almost certainly in log boats or skin, skin boats um, and would have taken all uh, certain aspects of their, their lifestyle with them. For example, they may have taken red deer with them uh, across the, um, the large waterway from Skye to um, the Outer Hebrides. Uh, we're still trying to find red deer, evidence of that red deer on our Mesolithic sites, but um, it's very hard. One thing we do do, and um, it's very clear in our, um, our research area in the North Atlantic, that there's lots and lots of storms and a huge problem of coastal erosion for both the local farmers, the local community, and also for the archaeological resource that is actually within, embedded in some of these places like sand dunes and, and other systems. But um, we actually take this as an opportunity, this climate change impact, because we use the sections that are created through the eroding um, sites, archaeological sites, to take very specific samples for dating and environmental archaeology. So we've instigated a program since 2010 in the Outer Hebrides, trying to find these Mesolithic sites by looking at coastal erosion sections and we've been very successful. We basically, um, we started with one site, which was known in the Western Isles at Northton, and we now have added a further seven or eight um, uh, Mesolithic sites in the Outer Hebrides now. So no longer is it a kind of a black hole of Mesolithic occupation. We're actually now furnishing the region and the, the, the set of islands in the Outer Hebrides with uh, a new kind of epoch of, of, of hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And as environmental archaeologists, we look at these things called ecofacts. So we look at the pieces of shell, the pieces of bone, the pieces of um, burnt um, plant macrofossils to try and understand how the humans um, lived in the environment that we know existed at the time from wider paleoenvironmental proxy records, such as pollen analysis, um, that we extract pollen grains from peat bogs and from um, lake systems. So, we, so we've got a very good idea of the sorts of environmental kind of um, landscapes that people are settling in, but importantly we're looking at the sorts of approaches that the people are taking to try and live in these new environments. So we use these ecofacts to try and look at those sorts of remains. So we've got a big team here in Durham looking at a variety of different types of remains to try and answer these different research questions. We're finding quite a few shell middens of um, around about six and a half to six thousand years old where Basically, we have piles and piles of shell deposited by the Mesolithic peoples. They're not eating the shellfish just for their own sake. We, they're using the shellfish, we think, as bait. What we think they were doing at these sites, these shell midden sites, was uh, basically throwing the shell midden meat into the sea uh, late um, summer, early autumn, when these shoals of very, very small safe come inshore and basically they then exploit this, this, this um, huge resource that occurs. And when you do this, the, the, sometimes the, the sea literally 
start sparkling silver, there's so many fish. They would get tens of thousands of fish when they're in these, these sites. Another wave of colonisation in the North Atlantic Islands is obviously the Vikings. And the first stepping stone into the, the, um, the, the region after Atlantic Scotland is the Faroes. And it's the orthodoxy of when the Vikings arrives in, is in the 9th century. Everyone agrees this. You can find lots of sites and it's, it's, in, the, it's in the records as well. But there has been some previous ephemeral evidence from um, other lines of evidence, contemporary literature, and also from pollen analysis, which has hinted at very ephemeral colonization events of much smaller groups. Um, there's a monk called Ducal, who in the court of Charlemagne in 825 described islands who, which could well be um, the pharaohs where um, religious anchorites went out to, to basically seek solitude from the Irish and Atlantic Scottish um, um, areas. In 2006-07 we uh, went to a site called Sondon which is again one of these large coastal erosion sections through a farm mound and we made a very very important discovery uh, at the very, very bottom of this um, section we found a Viking longhouse, but underneath that Viking longhouse we found a series of uh, burnt peat ash spreads with barley grains um, that contained evidence of pre-Viking um, colonisation, human presence in the area. And some of these barley grains gave us radiocarbon dates of 4th to 6th century. So this was the first archaeological evidence of a pre-Viking human presence in the Faroe Islands. Now the pharaohs are very, very important to understand this Viking migration or diaspora because they're the first stepping stone into um, Iceland and, and Greenland and, and eventually in North America and Lancer Meadows. So it's actually very, very important to understand that there's people there before the Vikings got there. Who were these people? Were they Irish monks or were they from Atlantic Scotland or were they people from Scandinavia, um, pre-Viking Scandinavians? It's very, very hard to tell given the evidence of some barley grains in some burnt peat ash, and that's all we've got from the archaeology. However, it is a major research question for the future. One of our key research themes and research areas for the future is to use our evidence of environmental change in the past and the adaptation of human societies to try and inform stakeholders across um, the North Atlantic Islands um, of how people will cope with rapid environmental change in the future. And the teams of students that we take to the various different islands will hopefully take this on board in their future careers and engage with this big 21st century challenge of societal adaptation to rapid environmental change.